Jehovah is the only true God, the sovereign of the universe. Some wicked spirits, and even humans, have deceitfully pretended to be gods. Other gods are nothing more than figments of human imagination. Those who put their trust in false gods are sure to be disappointed. False gods are incapable of blessing or protecting their worshipers. Psalm 96.5 says, All the gods of the peoples are worthless gods. In contrast, the true God Jehovah lovingly cares for his loyal worshipers and will never forsake them. In Bible times, there were some among Jehovah's people who deceived themselves into thinking that they could worship false gods without losing Jehovah's favor. For example, in Elijah's day, King Ahab married Jezebel and joined her in Baal worship. Many Israelites followed King Ahab, giving lip service to Jehovah while at the same time venerating the false god Baal. They're coming to know you, the only true God, and the one whom you sent, Jesus Christ. See, now, their argument goes like this. And you, you know it. Muslims use this. Unitarians use this. I mean, they use it. All anti-Trinitarians use this passage across the board who don't believe in the deity of Christ. Now, mind you, not all anti-Trinitarians deny the deity of Christ. Isn't that something? You have anti-Trinitarians that do believe Christ is fully God, even though they're against the Trinity. Those are the Jesus-only folk. The Oneness Pentecostals, also known as UPC, United Pentecostals, right? Modalists. They believe Jesus is God, but they deny the Trinity. So not all anti-Trinitarians deny the deity of Christ. So remember that, right? Not all of them do. Yep, they're heretics. They're not true believers. May God grant them uh, repentance that leads to salvation. Now, coming back to the Jehovah's Witnesses, they're going to quote this to prove that Jesus isn't, isn't God. You know why I laugh? You know why I laugh? I asked them. I said, okay, all right. You're, you're, you're using this to prove there's only one true God. Yeah, only one true God. Okay. Therefore, I have a problem with your translation. I have a serious problem with your translation. Don't tell me why. Well, what is it? If Jehovah is the only true God, then how can Jesus be a God according to your translation? After all, there's only one true God. So what kind of G God is Jesus? Here you go. John 1.1. 1, 1. What kind of God is Jesus? If Jehovah is the only true God, and Jesus Christ is not Jehovah, because the Father alone is Jehovah, according to their thinking. And yet, you admit Jesus is a God. What kind of God is Jesus? Remember, there is only one true God, right? They admit Jesus is a God. So I ask them, what kind of God is he? Is he a false God? They'll say no. Therefore, he must be the only true God. Because you only have two categories of gods here, right? The only true God and false gods. You with me there? The only true God and false gods. Since Jesus is a God, what kind of God is he? Can't be a false God, right? So then, according to John 17, 3, Jesus must be the only true God in order for him to be God in any, any sense of the term. So how does this backfire against us when it backfires against them? You with me? That's the first thing to note. We're going to have fun with this, by the way. We're going to have a lot of fun. Are you with me there? Or, or are you guys confused? Any, if anyone confused, put a two. If there's no one confused... The next line, I take them to Deuteronomy 32.39, Deuteronomy 32.39, and I ask them, okay, hold on. Deuteronomy 32.39, here's what I ask them. Now follow with me, saints. We're going to go slow, systematic, and methodical to demonstrate how the scriptures, even their perversion of the scriptures, <clears throat> does not support their false doctrines. It actually confirms what we believe if we know how to use their perverted texts, right? Because that's what it is. It's a perversion, not a translation. Deuteronomy 32, 39 from the New World Translation. Now we have a problem, saints. Notice what it says. See now that I, I am he, and there are no gods apart from me. I put to death and I make alive. I wound and I heal. Not only does John 17, 3 say there's only one true God, and the context is referring to the Father's only true God, and John 1, 1 says Jesus is a God, but Deuteronomy 32, 39 says there are no, there are no gods apart from Jehovah. If there are no gods apart from Jehovah, and the Father's the only true God, and yet John 1, 1 says Jesus is a God. What kind of God must Jesus be if there are no gods apart from Jehovah and there's only one true God? And definitely that means the, the includes the Father. We know the Father is the only true God. But since they even admit that Jesus is a God, what kind of God must he be 
If there's only one true God, and there is no other gods apart from Jehovah. Well, they can't admit false God, can they? They can't say that. So what option do they have? It doesn't say Jehovah is the only true God in the sense of prototype. Anyway, Deuteronomy 32, 39. Let's, again, on the same thing. John 17, 3. The Father is the only true God. John 1, 1, according to the New World Translation, Jesus is a God. <clears throat> Deuteronomy 32, 39, Jehovah speaking, See now that I, I am he, and there are no gods apart from me. I put to death and I make alive, and I wound, and I will heal, and no one can rescue from my hand. My question to every one of you is this. <clears throat> if there are no other gods with Jehovah, apart from Jehovah, and yet the New World Translation tells us Jesus is a God, what kind of God must Jesus be in order for the Bible to be harmonious and not contradictory? There's only one true God. There is no other God beside Jehovah, apart from Jehovah, and yet Jesus is a God. What kind of God must he be if the Bible is not contradictory, but harmonious with itself? Either he's a false God, which would be a blasphemous lie, or what other option? No Jehovah Witness will admit he's a false God, because that's blasphemy. God does not honor, glorify, and resurrect false gods. God does not share his worship and honor with a false god. You with me? Are you with me there? Coming back to the issue. So, let me give you further proof that Deuteronomy 3239 is a nightmare for their position. Pay attention to the language of the text and tell me whether this sounds familiar. Does this sound familiar for you guys? Watch. Watch here. I got a lot of material to cover regarding John 17:3. Guys, I'm still simply scratching the surface. John 10, 27 to 33 of the New World Translation. Remember, only use their translation to make your case. Okay? Only use their translation to make your case. John 10, 27-30. Let's read Deuteronomy 32, 39 and John 10, 27-30 back to back. See now that I, I am he, and there are no gods apart from me. I put to death, and I make alive. I wound, and I heal. I will heal. And no one can rescue from my hand. I make alive, and no one can rescue from my hand. Now watch this. Notice what Jesus says. My sheep listen to my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. Watch this. I give them everlasting life. Not only life, he makes alive. He gives them everlasting life. And they will by no means ever be destroyed. And no one will snatch them out of my hand. And no one can rescue from my hand. No one can snatch them out of my hand. What, the fa what my Father has given me is something greater than all other things. And no one can snatch them out of the hand of the Father, and I, the Father, one. Did you catch it? Jesus says, Jesus says, he gives everlasting life to all the sheep, and they never perish, and no one can deliver out of his hands, right? And yet, Deuteronomy 32, 39 says, and yet, Deuteronomy 32, 39 says, Jehovah makes alive, and none can snatch out of his hand. Did you catch it? Did you catch it, guys? Jehovah, Deuteronomy 32 says, there are no gods apart from me. I make alive, none can snatch out of my hand. Jesus comes and says, I give them everlasting life, and no one can deliver them out of my hand, and I and the Father are one in preserving the sheep. Is it a coincidence, or is Jesus deliberately taking the words of Job and applying it to himself? So is he claiming to be a God, or is he claiming to be God Almighty by claiming the things that only Jehovah can claim? Do you see it from their own translation? One more time, let me post John 10, 27 to 30. And let me post Deuteronomy 32, 39. Watch. Do you see it, guys? All right. Now, here's my question to every one of you. What kind of characteristics must Jesus have to take a multitude of people, whom Revelation says cannot be counted? They're so numerous, they can't be counted. There's so many, they can't be numbered. Let me show you that. That's Revelation 7, 9 to 10. Now, you need to... Revelation 7, 9 to 17 for the context. Now, what kind of attributes must the Lord Jesus have in order to be able to save and give everlasting life to a multitude of people that can't be numbered? That can't be numbered. Everyone with me? Read. Revelation 7, 9 to 17. Read this with me. First, let's see how many he gives everlasting life to. After this, I saw, look, this is Revelation 7, 9 to 17. A great crowd, which no man was able to number. Notice. The crowd happened to be so numerous they could not be counted. Of all nations and tribes and peoples and tongues, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, dressed in white robes, <coughs> and there were palm branches in their hands, and they keep shouting with a loud voice, saying, Salvation we owe to our God, 
who is seated on the throne and to the Lamb. Notice salvation doesn't just belong to God. It belongs to the Lamb as well. And here God means God the Father. Salvation originates from God the Father and the Lamb. And I'm going to show you why that's an astonishing, astonishing assertion in a minute. All the angels were standing around the throne and the elders and the four living creatures. And they fell face down before the throne and worshipped God, saying, Amen. Let the praise and the glory and the wisdom and the thanksgiving and the honor and the power and the strength be to our God forever and ever. Amen. Now watch. In response, one of the elders said to me, These who are dressed in the white robes, who are they and where did they come from? This great multitude that could not be numbered. Wearing white robes, who are they and where did they come from? So right away I said to him, My Lord, you are the one who knows. And he said to me, These are the ones who came out of the great tribulation. Now watch this, saints. Watch what 14 says. And they have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Did you catch it? Normally, if you dip a white robe in blood, it becomes stained. It becomes red. But the blood of the Lamb doesn't stain. It purifies and makes someone absolutely spotless, sinless, and pure. Catch it? Catch it there? The blood of Jesus made them absolutely pure, spotless, and perfect. Now, notice what it says after that. That is why they are before the throne of God. You see why they have the right to stand before God's throne, stand before him in service and worship, because the blood of Christ made them worthy enough to stand before the throne. That is why they are before the throne of God, and they are rendering him sacred service day and night in his temple. And the one seated on the throne will spread his tent over them. They will hunger no more. Praise God, that day is going to come sooner than later. This will really happen because Christ is really alive. We're talking about things that will happen. No more hunger, nor, nor thirst anymore. Neither will the sun beat down on them, nor any scorching heat. I pray we're part of this company, because the Lamb who is in the midst of the throne will shepherd them and will guide them to springs of water of life, and God will wipe out every tear from their eyes. Did you guys catch it? You see what Jesus did? He gives everlasting life. He purifies and makes a large crowd so numerous that they could not be counted, absolutely pure, perfect, sinless, and spotless, making them worthy enough to stand before God's presence forever. See what Jesus did? And you're telling me he's a finite creature? A finite creature can give everlasting life to a host of people that cannot be counted? That's how many they are? A finite creature can guarantee that none of these individuals will ever perish, be plucked out of his hand? A finite creature is able to purify a number of people, so numerous, so many that they can't be numbered, can't be counted, make them absolutely pure, thereby making them worthy to stand before God's presence forever. A finite creature can do this. A God can do this. And you understand the other dilemma to Joe Witness, right? Notice, the true God didn't save us, but an inferior, infinitely lesser God saved us. The true God didn't love us enough to die for us. Only an inferior, infinitely lesser God loved us enough to die for us, according to Joe's Witnesses. So then, according to the Joe's Witnesses, who actually loves you more, your creator or a creature who's infinitely less than the creator? Do you see the problem with their position? At least our position says that Jesus is God Almighty. So the infinite creator for whom we exist came down to show how much he loves us. You see that? Now let me show you again Revelation 7.10. Why, if you know the Old Testament, this will be mind-boggling. Watch here. Watch this verse, Revelation 7.10. Follow with me, saints. According to what you just read, salvation comes from... One person or two persons? The source of salvation, the origin of salvation, does it have a single source or a joint source? Read Revelation 7.10 for me and tell me. How many? Salvation we owe to our God, who is seated on the throne, and to the Lamb. So salvation comes from who? God the Father alone or God the Father and Jesus Christ the Lamb? So is it a single source or a joint source? Meaning two persons. What do you guys see? How many? Count. God meaning God the Father and who? Count for me. How many? Count for me, saints. Two, right? All right. But we have a problem. Remember, the Bible is not supposed to contradict, right? Psalm 3.8 says, salvation belongs to Jehovah. How could this great multitude of people who could not be numbered ascribe salvation to God the Father and Jesus Christ the Lamb if Jesus is not Jehovah, when Psalm 3.8 says, salvation belongs to Jehovah? Your blessing is upon your people. Can you show me a single passage in the Old Testament where it says, salvation belongs to Jehovah and someone else that's not Jehovah? Can you show me that? Salvation belongs to Jehovah and Moses. Salvation belongs to Jehovah and Joshua. Salvation belongs to Jehovah and Michael. You won't find that, right? 
because the Old Testament saints know the source of salvation, the origin of salvation, and the power to save comes from Jehovah alone, right? That's Psalm 3.8. So if that's the case, why is it that Revelation says salvation is owed to, derives from God the Father and Jesus Christ the Lamb, if Jesus is not Jehovah, right? Are you guys with me or am I putting you to sleep yet? You guys going to sleep yet? This is again reaffirmed in Jonah 2.9. Jonah 2.9. Read with me Jonah 2.9. The Lord Jesus gives us perfect health, safety, and, and anointing to glorify Him. But as for me, with the voice of thanksgiving, I will sacrifice to you. What I have vowed, I will pay. Salvation is from Jehovah. You see what Revelation did? The multitudes ascribed a work to both God the Father and Jesus Christ our Lord, who is the Lamb, who died to save us. Ascribed the work to both of them, which the Old Testament ascribes to Jehovah alone. The only way these passages can be conciliatory and not contradictory is if the New Testament writers, especially Revelation, believe and affirm that Jesus is no creature, but that Jesus is Jehovah in the same sense that God the Father is, even though he's not the Father. Everyone with me so far? And notice I'm not using the King James Bible. I'm using their Bible, correct? You see why you need to use their Bible? Because how are they going to get away from this? How are they going to deny this? How are they going to get away from this? Can they deny it? You better believe it is eternal. Now, we still got more. Let's go back to John 10, 27, 30 again. We're almost done with that part of the uh, argument, but I got a lot more with John 17, 3. And if you don't mind, I'll go through all of it with the time allotted. Here you go. John 17, 3 says the Father is only true God. But wait, John 10, 27, 30. My sheep listen to my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. I give them everlasting life, and they will by no means ever be destroyed, and no one will snatch them out of my hand. Watch. Jesus says, I give them everlasting life, and he gives everlasting life to a multitude that cannot be numbered, and no one will snatch them out of my hand. What kind of attributes, what kind of characteristics must Jesus have to perfectly preserve, oversee, and watch a great multitude of believers who cannot be numbered, guaranteeing their everlasting preservation? Attributes. Name them for me. Name them for me. What are the attributes he must possess, saints? You got it, David. You see where I'm going with this. But give me the specific characteristics. What are they? What characteristics does he have? Come on, saints. Are you guys asleep? This is where you can answer. Remember I said, if I ask a question, you can answer. He must be all-powerful. You got it. He must be omnipotent. What else? He must be omniscient. Exactly, Vladimir. Because he must know who the sheep are, right? And how many there are. He must know all of them. And he must be able to oversee all of them, right? So that means he must be omnipotent, omniscient, omnipresent. You're telling me a God has all these attributes? An infinitely lesser God has the omni-attributes which belong to God alone? Is that what you want me to believe? By the way, if the Father is the only true God and Jesus Christ is one with him in the ability to preserve believers from ever perishing, because that's the context. Remember, to read it again. Go to John 10 and read it. My, and what my Father has given me is greater than all things. And no one can snatch them out of the hand of the Father. I and the Father are one. So Jesus says, no one snatches them out of my hand. No one snatches them out of the Father's hand. I and the Father are one. Jesus just claimed to be one with the Father in the context of preserving all believers from ever perishing. He's claiming to be one with the Father in his ability to preserve believers perfectly forever. You with me there? So if Jesus is one with the Father in ability, in power, a power that only God possesses, and the Father is the only true God, then what kind of God must Jesus be if he's one with the only true God in power and ability? What kind of God must he be? You got it. The same kind of God, the only true God. And notice this is their translation, New Covenant Believer. I'm using their translation. Watch here. Remember Deuteronomy 32, 39 says, There are no gods apart from me, Jehovah. I kill and make alive, I wound and heal, and there's none that can snatch out of my hand. And yet Jesus used that language, right? Pay attention to John 10, 27. <clears throat> pay attention to John 10, 27. What did Jesus say right there? I want you to pay attention to that and see what he says. My sheep. Listen to my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. Oh, my sheep, hmm, my sheep, listen to my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. Now, you know why this is interesting? Here's a link to the 1984 edition of the New World Translation. They still make this available, and they still give them free of charge. You need both of them. You need the gray-colored 
2013 edition, which is online. I need the black cover, 1984 edition, which is also online. But get the printed editions from the Jehovah's Witnesses. Ask them for both. Okay, now, in the 1984 edition, let me read to you Psalm 95. Those links, yeah, that link I posted three times. I posted the same link three times, uh, believe the word. That's the 1984 edition of the New World Translation. Yeah, they did. They came up with a 2013 one and has some major revisions. Both of them are online. I gave you links to both. I was using the 2013 edition up to this point. Right now I'm going to switch. When a Jehovah Witness comes knocking at your door, he'll give you a gray colored Bible. That's the 2013 edition. But you need the black covered one, which is their 1984 edition. That link is to the 1984 edition. Everyone go there and go to Psalm 95. Let me get you to Psalm 95. You're going to see where I'm going with this. Psalm 95. All right, I'm going to give you the link there for a minute. Remember Jesus' words in John 10, 27? Good, believe the word. I'm prepping you for them so you can be used of the Lord. My sheep hear my voice. My sheep hear my voice, right? And what did he say? My sheep hear my voice. Listen to my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. I'm going to post it again. Here's the link to Psalm 95, so you can read with me. Watch here. You tell me Jesus is not claiming to be God Almighty. You try to convince me he's not claiming to be God Almighty. My sheep listen to my voice. I know them and they follow me. Now watch. Psalm 95, I gave you the link. Tell me what this sounds like. I'm going to post 6 and 7. But the key verse is 7. Well, let me post 6 so you understand and appreciate the context. Tell me what this sounds like. Tell me who Jesus was claiming to be. John 10, 27, it's right there. My sheep, they're my sheep, listen to my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. No one can pluck them from my hand, John 10, 28, right? No one can pluck them from my hand. My sheep listen to my voice. They're under my hand. No one can pluck them out of my hand. Psalm 95, 6 to 7. Oh, come in. Let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before Jehovah our maker, for he is our God, and we are the people of his pasturage and the sheep of his hand. Today, if you people listen to his own voice, you catch it? Believers are the sheep under God's hand, and they're supposed to hear God's voice. Jesus says, they are my sheep who listen to my voice, and no one can pluck them out of my hand. You see it? Let me post this again with John 10, 27, 28. Everyone see it? Could Jesus be any clearer in claiming to be Jehovah God in the flesh, even though he's not the Father? Could he be any clearer? Now, just to prove to you that if you follow the Bible, you have to believe that Jesus is Jehovah, but you cannot believe that he's the Father. Now, compare in Psalm 95, 6 to 7, Oh, come in, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before Jehovah, our Maker. For he is our God, and we are the people of his pasturage and the sheep of his hand. Today, if you people listen to his own voice. And then it goes on to say, verse 8, do not harden your hearts. But, notice again, John 10, 27, 28, My sheep listen to my voice. So we are his sheep. It's his voice we hear. I know them, and they follow me. I give them everlasting life, and they will by no means ever be destroyed. No one will snatch them out of my hand. Jehovah says his people are the sheep of his hand, under his hand of protection, and they're to hear his voice. Jesus says, God's people are my sheep under my hand of protection. They hear my voice, and I give them everlasting life. They never perish. Who does Jesus think he is? Yes, it's not. Maybe it is. Yahweh is the name of the Godhead. Now, let me show you something interesting about John 10.30 that you don't see. You don't see in, in the English. I am the Father one. Now, I'm going to have to give you a link to confirm this. You better believe it. He's God in the flesh. Now, I want you to go to this link, saints. This is a link where you get the Greek and the English translation of the Greek above it and the English words beneath it so you can compare for yourself. Okay? Let me get it for you for John 1030. Here it is. John 1030. Yep, that's exactly it. If you want proof that Jesus is not the same person as the Father, go here. I posted a link three times. You're going to see that Jesus says, I am the Father, one we are. You're going to see the Greek words, hain, esmen. Okay. Hain means one. It's neuter. But esmen means we are. It's plural. We are. The plural esmen is proof, or esmen is proof, that it's more than one person. More than one person. Jesus says, I am the Father, one we are. Proving it's more than one person, but these two persons are one. We are. Esmen is we are. Proving... Jesus is not the Father. We are, literally. You guys see it? Literally, we are one. One we are. So if you want any, if you want strong proof, strong proof that Jesus is not the Father, but he's a distinct person from the Father, here it is. 
Esmein is we are. So they're one, not in person. They're not one person. It's not a single person. They're one in essence, nature, and power. But they're more than one person. Two persons who are God. Two persons who exist as one God. Ego kai, ha pater, and esmein. Hain, I'm sorry. You have to do the breathing sound. Hain, pen, hen. You got to practice your Greek pronunciation, especially when this first century Koine Greek. Hain, esmein. So, what have we learned thus far? The Father is the only true God. John 17, 3. John 17, 3. The Father is the only true God. The society translates John 1, 1 in such a way that ends up making Jesus a God. 239 says, there are no other gods besides Jehovah, apart from Jehovah. So if there are no other gods apart from Jehovah, the Father is the only true God. Jesus is a God, and yet he's one with the Father in his ability to preserve all believers forever, guaranteeing their everlasting life and everlasting preservation. What kind of God must Jesus be according to their own perversion of the Bible? What kind of God must he be in light of all of this? You catch it, right? Amen. Jesus Christ, our God, is infinitely greater than the evil one who's been crushed on the feet of Jesus. He must be the only true God. So when a Jehovah Witness tells you, see, Jesus isn't Jehovah, the Father is the only true God, you take them to John 1.1. 1, 1. So far, we see that passage actually backfires against the Jehovah's Witnesses, right? Because Jesus says things and claims things, and John says things about Jesus in the Gospel of John that demonstrate that Jesus is just as much the true God as the Father is. So what's the point of John 17, 3? Jesus is simply affirming the fact the Father is the only true God without denying that he is also God. No more, no less. He's not saying, oh, Father, you're the only true God in contrast to me. No, you are the only true God because that's who you are in union with me. I in union with you because he's one with the Father in the divine ability to give everlasting life and preserve all believers forever, which means that he possesses the power of God. So he's one with the Father in divine power as well as in omniscience and omnipresence. Well, if he's one with the Father, and the Father is the only true God, then Jesus must be the true God just as much as the Father is, right? Otherwise, the Jehovah's Witnesses are going to have to admit that Jesus is a false God. Because if there's only one true God, and Jesus is a God, either he must be the true God or he's a false God. No way around this. But it's going to get better. Are you ready? Better for us, worse for them. Better for us, worse for them. Are you guys ready for it? How many of you guys are ready? Who's ready for the next line of evidence? Come on. Help me out. The next line of evidence you use is the New World Translation of Jude. Remember, you have to use the New World Translation. That's the purpose. How to witness more effectively to Joe's witnesses. You go to Jude 1. I just gave you the link. And quote verse 4. It's only one chapter, 25 verses. Go to Jude 1 and quote verse 4. Okay? Certain men have slipped in among you who were long ago appointed to this judgment by the Scriptures. They are ungodly men who turn the undeserved kindness of our God into an excuse for brazen conduct and who prove false to our only owner and Lord Jesus Christ. Now, if the Father being the only true God means that Jesus can't be God, then Jesus being our only owner and Lord proves that the Father can't be our owner or Lord. You see the logic? And here it's despotes, despot. Jesus is our only despotes and kurios, our only despotes and kurios, only owner and Lord. So understand the point. If the Father being the only true God means that Jesus can't be God in an absolute sense, then Jesus Christ being our only owner and Lord proves that the Father can't be owner or Lord because there's only one. Only owner and Lord, Jesus Christ. Only owner and Lord, Jesus Christ. Now, what would I say to that? What do you think they're going to say to that? No, no, no. Jesus can be the only owner and Lord without excluding the Father. Likewise, the Father can be the only true God without excluding the Son. Just because the passage says the, the Father is the only true God, don't automatically assume that excludes the Son. That excludes everyone else besides the Son, as well as the Holy Spirit. Just as a quick clarification, because the recording itself cuts, Sam is essentially saying in this context, the Father is the only true God, but not to the exclusion of the Son and the Spirit. That is what he was saying. There was a cut in the recording, so don't misunderstand what was said. Just like here, Christ can be our only owner and Lord, not to the exclusion of the Father or the Holy Spirit. What I'm basically trying to prove here is that something can be said about one specific divine person or member of the Godhead that does not mean would equally apply to the other members of the Godhead. Whatever is true of the Father in respect to his divine nature would be equally true of the Son and the Spirit, because all of them are fully divine. So yes, Christ can be called the only owner and Lord, 
but not to the exclusion of the Father and the Son. Because whatever the Son would be in relation to His divine nature would equally be true in reference to the Father and the Holy Spirit because they partake of the same divine nature. The Son and the Spirit eternally partake of the nature of the Father. So the Father is the only true God in union with the Son and the Spirit, not to the exclusion of them. Is it making sense to every one of you? And is this helping you, saints? And how to witness more effectively to them? Even more. Even more. Hold on. Now watch this. Watch this. We're not going to look at passages from their translation where the words only, one, none, that language is used of the Son to see the implications this has. Watch here. Acts 4.12, saints. Acts 4.12. Remember, this is referring about uh, to Jesus. And Jesus is not Jehovah according to them. Watch here. Watch here. Furthermore, there is no salvation in anyone else. For there is no other name under heaven that has been given among men by which we must get saved. This is about Jesus. Since there is no salvation in anyone other than Jesus, and there is no other name besides the name of Jesus that can save anyone, that means the Father is not a Savior, nor is the Holy Spirit. And worse still, that means Jehovah is no Savior, because according to them, Jesus is not the Savior. You with me there? You see, no salvation in anyone else, no other name under heaven besides the name of Jesus. They'll tell you, oh, but Jehovah made him the Savior. You tell them, you're still not getting the point. Let's see how Jehovah appointed him to be Savior. I go, you're still not getting the point. I don't care whether Jehovah appointed him Savior or not. The language says there is no other Savior. Salvation can't be found in anyone else except Jesus. So using your logic, this excludes the Father and Jehovah as well. Are you with me there? So whether you want to quote passages where he was made the Savior, appointed Savior, that doesn't solve the problem for you. Because still, he's the only one who saves to the exclusion of Jehovah, right? Because he's not Jehovah according to you. See the problem with their hermeneutic? They do not know how to interpret Scripture consistently, but their method of interpretation posits Scripture against Scripture, pits Scripture against Scripture. It's only we, Trinitarians, who by the grace of God's Spirit know how to interpret Scripture, that are able to harmonize these passages. You with me there? Now, as a Trinitarian, I have no problem saying there's no salvation in anyone else. And there's no other name under heaven that has been given among men by which we must get saved. Because Jesus is Jehovah. And what is true about Jesus in regards to his deity would be equally true in reference to the Father and the Spirit. So this language is not excluding the Father and the Spirit because it would include them by virtue of the fact that both of them are in perfect union with the Son. So this language excludes everyone other than the members of the Godhead. If you're not a member of the Godhead, it excludes you. It does not exclude the other divine persons. Likewise, when Jesus says the Father is the only true God, that's to the exclusion of everyone other than the divine persons of the Godhead. It's referring to those outside the Godhead. It says nothing about the Son and the Spirit who are perfectly, inseparably in union with the Father. You with me there? Is that clear so far? Here's another one. And I'm not even done yet. Here's another one. We'll take a short break and we'll continue. Another one, saints. Revelation 19.12 from their translation. Remember, according to them, only... The words only, one, none, no one, the way they you interpret those passages, they interpret them to exclude the Son. Well, let's be consistent. Go to Revelation 19, 12, chapter 19, verse 12, and let's read. This is again about Jesus. If you don't believe me, go read from verse 11 all the way down. This is again about Jesus Christ, our Lord. Watch here. New World Translation. His eyes are a fiery flame, and on his head are many diamonds. He has a name written that no one knows but he himself. No one knows Jesus' name but Jesus alone. That means the Father doesn't know, and the Spirit doesn't know. Therefore, Jesus knows more than the Father and the Spirit together. He knows something that they don't know, right? So Christ is our only owner and Lord. Therefore, the Father can't be our owner, can't be our Lord. Christ is the only Savior. There is no other Savior besides Him. Therefore, the Father and the Spirit can't be our Savior. Only Christ knows His name, no one else. Therefore, the Father and the Spirit do not know His name. You see how silly that sounds? You know why it's silly? Because we know the Father knows all that the Son knows and knows everything about the Son. And the Spirit knows all that the Son knows and everything about the Son. The Spirit knows all that the Son knows and everything about the Son. Therefore, whatever the Son knows, automatically they would know. So here, no one doesn't mean to the exclusion of the Father and the Spirit. To the exclusion of everyone other than the members of the Godhead. And which Jesus is in perfect union with. Is it clear? Clear so far? If there's anyone confused who needs an answer to the material thus far, put a two. 
Any confused people, put it to it. It's okay. If you don't get it, let me know. I'm here to help you if you're asking sincerely. All right. Let's take a five to six minute break. Let's get some refreshments or food, whatever. And we'll resume in about five to six minutes. Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Jehovah is the only true God, the sovereign of the universe. Some wicked spirits, and even humans, have deceitfully pretended to be gods. Other gods are nothing more than figments of human imagination. Those who put their trust in false gods are sure to be disappointed. False gods are incapable of blessing or protecting their worshipers. Psalm 96.5 says, All the gods of the peoples are worthless gods. In contrast, the true God Jehovah lovingly cares for his loyal worshipers and will never forsake them. In Bible times, there were some among Jehovah's people who deceived themselves into thinking that they could worship false gods without losing Jehovah's favor. For example, in Elijah's day, King Ahab married Jezebel and joined her in Baal worship. Many Israelites followed King Ahab, giving lip service to Jehovah while at the same time venerating the false god Baal. 